All right then, so. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it's been a little bit. Um, I was taking a short break to kind of, um, you know, recuperate myself a little bit after doing so many build videos back to back, but I am back now and I'm going to be trying to release um, videos a bit more consistently. Uh, still taking requests as this build is request and I will be taking requests in the future, so please leave them down in the comments below. Uh, but this request comes from YouTube user Alex N Nelson, I believe. Yes, Alex Nelson. And he basically requested that I do a Pyromancer theme build, um, which I am very, very happy to oblige. Now, Pyromancers, well, in D&D, they're quite simple to build, really. It doesn't really take a lot to kind of get a successful Pyromancer build. Uh, I think most people would just go straight to, uh, in at least in this game, straight to Draconic uh, Sorcerer with a Fire Ancestor, and then just level that up pretty much all the way, maybe taking some dips in Fighter or Paladin or something if they wanted to go for a Gish-type build. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be doing that, simply because this build is kind of... Not really to bash on other people's creativity, but it is a dime a dozen. It's definitely the default build for a Pyromancer style playstyle. And so I wanted to try and do something a little bit different. If you are looking for, like, a Sorcerer Pyromancer build, then I'm sure there is a thousand different build videos out there, probably covering it in great detail. So I wanted to try something a little different. Uh, I want to kind of go for a different flavor of Pyromancer. Definitely still a Pyromancer focused on fire magic, but um, done in a very different way with a different kind of theming to it that I think will bring about a unique option for Pyromancers. So, uh, I, I kind of theory crafted a few things. I wanted to try getting a build together where I got as much fire magic as possible. Because if you actually go all the way sorcerer, or even all the way wizard, uh, you don't actually get access to all of the more decent fire spells in the game. And I felt that was a bit of a shame. But there is actually a class in this game that gets access to a hell of a lot of them. And I'm going to go over it today. So, uh, I actually am going to kind of do a little brief thing here before we get into it about the different kind of steps I took to get to this build. Uh, obviously I went initially with the uh, Draconic Sorcerer type deal and while I found that to be a pretty good build, you know you get to cast lots of spells, you get lots of fire, you get to add your charisma modifier at level 6 it is good, but it is just playing a sorcerer and I felt like while well, yeah that's perfectly fine for a game like this, it it's not quite what I want to do with these build videos. I want to bring unique ideas. Uh, well, <sighs> that sounds like I'm trashing on people's playstyles, but I'm honestly not trying to. Uh, I did actually mess around with Druid for a bit as well for the Flame Blade spell and kind of thinking, oh, you know, you could do like a Flame Gish with like Flame Blade and, you know, fire spells, but it ended up being too multi ability to score dependent, mad, um, with the fact that Flame Blade would scale off of your wisdom where uh everything else would probably want to scale off your charisma because you would still want to do the sorcerer since cleric uh doesn't really get a lot of fire spells i did toy around with the idea of going druid three four elements monk nine to kind of do like a martial gish fighter thing but that's basically my nero build subbing out the barbarian levels for druid for use of a uh, Flame Blade Scimitar, which you can only cast at maximum level 2, so it's not that great for a primary weapon, because you don't get more spell slots with Monk. So, I was really, really struggling, but I think I've found a build that is cool, unique, and does some interesting things. So we're going to start with Draconic Sorcerer. <laughs> Look. You have to start with Draconic Sorcerer if you want to get one simple thing. And that is the Firebolt Cantrip. Now, I've looked into different ways of like getting Firebolt. Uh, you can do it in quite a few ways. There is the Spell Sniper Feat, uh, Magic Initiate Sorcerer, uh, a few different things. But 
it's unfortunate because you don't really want to be getting Fireball at level 4. This is going to be your main source of damage pretty much all the time, right? Um, because, obviously, you're, if you're going a full caster, which we are here, your weapon attacks aren't going to be that great. So you're really, really going to want to rely on a sturdy, reliable cantrip. And not getting that until level 4, especially when you want to play a pyro theme build, especially if you're challenging yourself to basically only use fire spells. It's really... It's, it's impossible not to take at least one level of sorcerer here. So, we're taking Draconic Sorcerer, we're getting Firebolt straight away. As for your other cantrips, you can take friends, as I always do, you can take anything here. I'm going to actually grab um, Acid Splash. Because, well, it is a useful thing if you're up close and personal, so you'll have disadvantage on Firebolt. Having a second cantrip option that does actually scale quite decently is nice to have. Uh, so, you know, our Pyromancers can get a little bit of Acid Damage as a treat. Uh, lastly, take whatever Minor Illusion. I'm going to try to avoid taking other damaging spells if I can, just to stay on the Pyro theme, but I do like having this little backup option here. It's the only it's the only non-fire damage spell that I'm going to conscious, consciously take. As for your basic spells, uh, you want to take whatever here. I would personally recommend Chromatic Orb and maybe Shield. I mean, obviously Burning Hands is right there. This is where I'm going to get into the um, the race choice here. We are playing a Mephistopheles Tiefling, which is super, super important because you get Burning Hands as a level 2 as part of your racial, fe racial features, as well as another spell that we'll be getting to later, which was actually a nice surprise to find. Uh, but yeah, play as a Mephistopheles Tiefling, background as whatever, but you definitely want to take a Mephistopheles Tiefling here because it is super important to this build. Also, you get Fire Resistance for free, which is just on theme. Uh, but Chromatic Orb here is a nice uh, ranged spell. It can do fire damage, and it creates a fire surface, which is always really nice to have. And again, Shield is just a nice utility spell to have. If you want to take Burning Hands here, you can, but you are going to get it later anyway, kind of. That's just part of the kit that we're going to be getting, so I don't really recommend it. Just take something utility-based. I'm going to grab Shield here because you never know when it could be useful. As I said, we're going Draconic Bloodline, and we're going to pick our Draconic Ancestor here. We are going to pick Black. Hear me out. So, since we're not sticking with Sorcerer very long, in fact, we're not even going to level up in Sorcerer again, it doesn't make sense to take a Red Dragon here when we're going to be getting Burning Hands anyway. Uh, and the fact that it's not going to be scaling up or anything like that, and we're not going to be getting the, like, f like elemental resistance from Draconic Sorcerer or the elemental boost to damage. Uh, so there's no reason to take any of the reds here. So we might as well take a spell that gives us really good utility, and a Pyromancer can get a lot of use out of the Grease spell. Cover the ground in Grease, slowing creatures within and possibly making them fall prone. So it creates a difficult space for enemies to get through, but also... It can be lit on fire for a decent-sized explosion, so it comes as a bit of a setup, similar to how lightning builds we use create and destroy water. Fire builds can use grease. So I feel like taking the Black Dragon Ancestry here is actually pretty cool. So yeah, take it on. Uh, obviously, you can choose to have scales here. I'm going to take them off personally. Uh, this is about what you want your stats to look like. Except no, it isn't, because <laughs> I keep forgetting it changes it when you uh, respec. Uh, but this is actually pr not too bad. Um, I would say definitely your charisma needs to be maxed out. Your constitution definitely needs to be at a decent level. And your dexterity can be around here. I would take wisdom up to 10 so that you kind of can make those saving throws. And also ha not have all of your <laughs> soft stats be negatives. So I think this is a good stat spread to have. Um, as for your proficiencies, take whatever you like. It really doesn't matter. I would... Except I would stay away from Persuasion and Deception, because we'll be able to get those later a different way. I would actually take Insight and Arcana. Uh, I have Sly of Hand and stuff as a, as a background, because I chose um, the Urchin background, just for no particular reason, but I like having these skills. So, yeah. Straight into level 2, and as I said before, we're going to be jumping straight out of Sorcerer, and into Warlock. So... Immediately, I, I just need to get this out of the way, because this may make you want to turn off the video early or whatever, and I won't waste your time. The rest of the levels here we're going to be taking are Warlock levels, and I know that comes with the caveat of low, a low amount of spell slots, which is by far this build's biggest weakness. 
but you'll find that with the spells we're getting and the spells we're taking, uh, and the ability to recover those spell slots on a short rest, you're going to find that the power level of this build absolutely skyrockets and makes it a really unique and interesting thing. But I'm going to kind of get into the theming of this build now, because I feel like with a warlock, you can kind of create an interesting theme in and like character archetype of someone who is so obsessed with fire that they're willing or like obsessed with power that they called on the demons of hell to like gain this infernal power. I think that's pretty cool. But with this character here, I kind of tried to show something interesting in the design uh, with like maybe that your character was born a sorcerer with an, if with an influence for um, or an affinity for fire magic, but it was so hard to control and contain that it actually ended up damaging their body and causing them to burn themselves. So... They, and so when they were at their lowest, a deity uh, or some sort of fiend preyed on them and basically made them their patron to control the fire, saving their life, but also making them in debt, in debt to them, like a debt to servitude and all that sort of thing. Can't use my words today. <laughs> but yeah, so I think actually a pyromancer warlock literally taking their fires directly from the hells itself it's actually a really, really cool way of doing a Pyromancer, rather than it just being like Dragon man Magic or just an innate control of fire. I think it's a unique take on the concept. But anyways, enough about me making head cannons. Let's actually get into the build. So, uh, for your cantrips, bye bye Eldritch Blast. I am specifically going to go out of my way not to take this for as long as possible, because obviously it is the most powerful cantrip in the game, damage-wise. And I don't want to just be relying on that the whole time instead of what the actual build is for, so we're going to leave it behind. I would take Poison Spray and Blade Ward here. A little bit of poison damage as a treat. And Blade Ward because it's just nice to have. And speaking of getting taking power from a Fiend, we are going with the Fiend uh, subclass here. This is extremely important because this is where we're going to be getting the bulk of our Pyromancy spells from. Uh, and overall, it's just a really nice subclass. You gain the ability to gain temporary hit points whenever you down a creature, and this will get higher as you level up, I believe. So it's a nice thing to have. As for your spells, well, we're going to be taking Burning Hands here. Now, we want to take Burning Hands here because while we do get Burning Hands as a Rachel feature, uh, we're only able to cast it once per long rest. So this is going to give us more uses of it over the course of the game. We're also going to be taking Hellish Rebuke here. Uh, there is actually very few ways to get Hellish Rebuke. It's either level 1 Warlock or Oathbreaker Paladin. And I wanted this as like a fire-based spell. So I would definitely go for Hellish Rebuke here and Burning Hands. Just so you get that nice base kit of fire damage. Really, really cool. You use Hellish Rebuke on the reaction to deal a bunch of fire damage. It's really nice. I like it. And Burning Hands is just an overall good level 1 fire spell that scales up quite nicely. Moving on. Next up at Warlock level 2, we're going to be getting one of the big parts of Warlock. You know him, you'll love him, the Eldritch Invocations. Now, most people at this point would be like Agonizing Blast or Impelling Blast to bump up their Eldritch Blast, but we're not doing that here. Instead, I want you to take some stuff that is kind of just for utility and fun. Uh, we're going for Beguiling Influence here to get those proficiencies in Deception and Persuasion. Really, really important in Baldur's Gate 3. And you can take Beast Speech, uh, Fiendish Vicar, if you didn't take a Tiefling, take Devil's Sight. There's a lot of options here, and I'm going to suggest Fiendish Vicar. Specifically because we're going to be using a unique mechanic in this build that is going to be taking our health away each turn. So being able to cast False Life is going to give us a little bit more out of that utility. Uh, as for your spells, there's not really any options here to take that are on the theme, so I would just grab Hex. Uh, we don't use our bonus action that much in this build, so being able to have a nice strong bonus action option to just be able to do extra damage is nice. Overall, it's not necessary. If you feel like you, something like Armor of Agathis would be more useful, that you could do that. Uh, or Protection from Evil and Good. Don't do that. Um, right. On, we've got our invocations already, and here is where we're going to be getting our once per long rest burning hands. Cast as level 2. Pretty decent spell overall, it's just nice to have, since again, limited spell slots, so any extra spells that don't use our spell slots are a welcome addition. Uh, you get this at total level 3. Moving on. This, next up, we're at Warlock level 3, and now we get to get another big part of the Warlock's kit, the Pact Boon. Uh, I'll go straight to this. This is kind of a pick your favorite situation. We're mainly here for the subclass and the invocations of Warlock. The Pact Boon isn't actually going to come up as often here. 
uh, you can take Pact of the Chain. If you really, really like the devil theming of getting your power from the Hells itself, having an Imp Familiar to kind of bolster that is actually very, very nice um, thematically and conceptually. Uh, obviously, having an Imp Familiar has its benefits, uh, and later on they'll be able to use things like Extra Attack. So if you want to go with that, you can. Uh, Pact of the Blade... Um... If you're going the flame blade route, this may be useful, but you can't exactly bind a flame blade. I can't see this being useful. Yes, you can get some weapons here that work off your spellcasting ability modifier. You get a few options. So maybe that could actually be quite useful if you're not using flame blade or you don't really have a good weapon leading up to getting our final weapon of the build. So there is definitely a reason to take flame blade. Just don't be expecting to bind any super powerful weapons here. Back to the Tome comes up next, and I would definitely say that this may be the more powerful choice. Uh, you get Guidance, Vicious Mockery, and Form right off the bat, a nice little utility kit. Uh, guidance is always useful. But later on at level 5, this will give you three spells, and one of them is Haste, which you can cast once upon long rest. So if you want to use Haste on this build, you definitely want to take the Pact of the Tome. Uh, but since we're not using a bow in this build, you can do what I've done in my other builds and take the, um, the Darkfire Shortbow, which will give you haste for once per long rest anyway. So it's not really necessary. I mean, you can take both if you want two haste per long rest, which actually does sound like an interesting option. But I think for the sake of... I'm probably never going to get the chance to use Pact of the Chain again. I think I'm going to take Pact of the Chain here to get the Imp Familiar, because that just seems so on theme and really, really fun for me here. Uh, as for your spells, obviously we're going to be taking Scorching Ray, one of the most powerful fire spells in the game, aside from the obvious one uh, that we'll get to later. Um, it scales up really nicely, it lets you damage multiple foes, it's a super, super good spell that I would recommend taking on pretty much most casting builds, if especially a Pyromancer build. Yep, moving on. Warlock level 4 is up next, and we're finally getting our first feat. Uh, but let's move on to our cantrip first. I really don't want to click that middle one, so we're going to take Necrotic Touch, because we're just avoiding this one, and I refuse to take True Strike out of principle. Uh, next up is our spells. We are going to take whatever you like here. It really doesn't matter, since there's nothing else on theme here. I mean, you can always get a use out of Misty Step in a clutch situation. Again, limited spell slots means we're not going to be teleporting left and right. But can come up, can be useful. Mirror image, hold person, anything you like here. I'll take Misty Step for the utility because you never, ever know when it's going to be useful. And I think um, just having it as a backup plan is always good. Uh, next up, our feet. Now, the obvious choice here would be uh, to take Elemental Adept to basically bypass fire resistance. Uh, but I feel like it's... Yeah, at this stage of the game, you're probably going to be playing level 5 around kind of starting to end Act 1, starting to begin Act 2. And there's not actually many things that you're going to be facing that are going to be resistant to fire at this point. Uh, those come much more in the end game, from what I understand. So I would actually just go with your ability score improvement here, bumping your charisma up to 19. And then, as always, using RTF Full Spoon to take it up to 20. I feel like this is a good strong baseline for everything you want this build to do, so taking the ability score improvement here is definitely the right way to go. Next up at wall at level 5, we're going to be getting our deepened pact feature, which means because we picked pact of the chain, our familiar is going to gain an extra attack, which is nice. Uh, but if you were a Blade Warlock, you'd get an extra attack with your Pact Weapon, and Tome Warlocks would get Animate Dead, Haste, and Call Lightning here. Uh, haste, really the only useful spell there. I mean, Animate Dead can have some uses, but it's not really on theme, and Call Lightning can be on theme, but only if you're a fan of Avatar The Last Airbender, like myself. But again, it requires concentration, so it's... 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 Whatever. But uh, we get our extra attack with our Familiar here, which is always nice. Moving on to spells, we're getting level 3 spells here, which means we get the big bad fireball. 8d6 fire damage cast with a level 3 spell slot. In a radius, it's a deck save. It's fireball. It is the classic. It is the memed to death spell. And it's done for a reason. It's good. It's damn good. And this game is no different. Fireball on a Pyro build is a no-brainer, so make sure you got this one in your kit. We also get another Eldritch Invocation here, and we actually get a couple of new options. Maya the Mind, which lets us cast slow, and 
sign of ill omen, which let us cast curse. N or bestow curse, even. But I have a problem with these, and that's the fact that they use a warlock spell slot. And they're also not really on theme, so I would recommend just taking something like Be Beast Speech to gain Speak of Animals. Uh, maybe you could take Mouse Got Many Faces for Disguise Self. Uh, you could you could take Agonizing Blast here if you feel like you do want to grab Eldritch Blast, if you feel like Fireball is starting to underperform. Um, so it's a pick your favorite situation. I'm going to go with Beast Speech just because it's a nice utility to have and it's fun for dialogue in any playthrough. So, yeah, moving on. Next up at Warlock level 6, we are going to get another subclass feature, and because we chose the Fiend, we are getting Dark One's own luck. I believe this is once per short rest or long rest, I can't exactly remember, I wish it told me. Uh, you get to call on your patron to change your fate and add a 1d10 to any ability check. Really good for those super important checks you absolutely need to get at that time, a d10 is nothing to sneeze at. Definitely a nice little bonus that we get at this level. Moving on to spells, now... There are obvious, there is a lot of choices here, the obvious one being Counterspell, um, and that is a perfectly good option to pick if that is what you like, but I would actually like to propose something else. Gaseous Form. Now, hear me out. A Pyromancer that can turn his body into smoke and fly away and go through small cracks and do this and do that, you get to become like a smoke monster. Like... I actually think it's kind of sick as a concept, so I'm going to take Gaseous Form here because I like to. But obviously, anything else here is also good. Except Witch Bolt. Nobody likes Witch Bolt. Next up, we are a Warlock 7. This means we're going to be getting our hands on another spell, and we are at level 4. And there are two spells that we want here that are super, super good. Fire Shield and Wall of Fire. I'm personally going to be taking Fire Shield first because I think this is going to be one of those spells you're pretty much going to be casting every fight. It doesn't require concentration. It'll give you resistance to cold damage because we're going to be using the Warm Variant to stay on theme. And anybody who comes near you is going to be uh, taking fire damage for being close. And if they melee attack you, they're going to be taking damage as well. Super, super cool spell to just have up pretty much all throughout a fight. Definitely take this here. Now, we get Eldritch Invocations here. I'm going to suggest you take this one here, the Book of Ancient Secrets. It's going to give you Ray of Secrets, Silence, Ray of Secrets, Ray of Sickness, Silence, and Chromatic Orb, all castable once per long rest. Um, basically, it's more free spells, including Chromatic Orb, which can be done with fire, which is on theme. So you get another spell that you can use that will fuel every, basically the pyro aspect of this build. Definitely worth taking this here. Uh, we have a couple of other options, one being Polymorph, which breaks my heart in this game, because Polymorph just lets you turn enemies into sheep. I know why they did it, doesn't make me any less upset. And Dreadful Words, which lets you cast Confusion, I've already done my Psychic Warrior build, so we're going to ignore this one. Take Book of Ancient Secrets here to form mainly for Chromatic Orb, but the others are a nice bonus. Next up, we're looking at Warlock level 8, which means we are going to be getting our next feat, but let's quickly look at the spell first, and we're going to be taking Wall of Fire, this is a spell that I kind of underrated when I actually played uh, casually for the first time. Uh, because it uses concentration, I always thought, eh, this spell doesn't really do what I want it to. I mean, I'd rather be casting haste or something like that. But when you're focusing on fire spells, Wall of Fire can actually be really, really good in the right circumstances. Uh, line up some explosive barrels for a grease ring on the floor, go to a crowded area, and you could just make Wall of Fire your enemy's worst nightmare. Super, super cool spell, does a ton of damage, um, it's great utility, and obviously is on theme, so grab it here. And onto our feet, I mentioned it already, we're going to be grabbing Elemental Adept here, and we're going to be grabbing Fire. It gives us, it, al it allows our um, fire spells to ignore resistance, which is good. And in addition, when you deal with fire damage with a spell, you cannot roll a 1, so we're always going to be getting decent damage, at least higher than a 1. So, definitely worth taking here, and it would definitely at level 9, at the point of the game where this will be relevant. Next up at Warlock level 9, we're going to be getting another Eldritch Invocation and another spell. Having a look at the spells, we're finally onto level 5 spells. And this is the big one, Flame Strike. This gets a significant buff over its 5th edition counterpart. Basically, this is now, in my opinion a better 
more powerful version of Fireball, at least on a Warlock. It does 5d6 fire plus 5d6 radiant damage. It strikes down. It's a deck save um, as well as Fireball, so it kind of just is a more damaging version of Fireball. And usually in video games, split damage can be a bit can be a bit off because uh, you're dealing with se separate resistances and defenses. But I find that in this game, uh, it's helpful against enemies that do have a uh, fire resistance, even though we do ignore that now. Uh, if we are up against enemies with fire immunity, which definitely do exist, this is still a pretty decent option. Since we're locking ourselves into fire magic, we definitely want to make sure we have something up our sleeve that can do it. I also quite like the idea thematically that the character may be so obsessed with gaining p power through fire, but some far off deity of fire just says, hey, I like the cut of your jib. Here's a big fuck off explosion from the heavens. I really like this. I think it's cool. And other than going nine levels of cleric, this is like the only way to get this spell. So I absolutely wanted to take it here. Now, this is another cool thing. We're going to be taking the Minions of Chaos um, Eldritch Invocation, which is going to let us conjure, el use Conjure Elemental with a spell slot. This means not only do we get a massive big hel Heaven Strike of Fire, we're also going to be getting our very own Summonable fire elemental companion which is significantly going to help the damage potential of this build so awesome 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 thing level nine of warlock is filled with stuff it's awesome next up at warlock 10 we're going to be getting another subclass feature this one being fiendish resistance you choose a damage type and become resistant to it and you can pick a new damage type each short rest and it lasts I believe until you take a long rest so basically just pick a damage type and be resistant to it with fire shield our natural innate fire resistance and this you get three resistances out of this build which is really really neat actually I think that's pretty cool uh obviously it's just more of a bonus we're not really here for it but to have it is nice we do get another cantrip at this level and as much as it pains me to say it Take Eldritch Blast. At this point, it's going to be doing three rays. It's powerful. Um, it's it's probably going to overtake Fireball, unless you're specifically using the equipment that Fireball is going to benefit from. Um, but if you really, really want to stay on theme, don't use the spell. It's just here because we're forced to take something, and I, again, refuse to take True Strike out of principle. Uh, next up, we do get another spell here. Now, we've kind of run out of pyro spells, unfortunately. However, we're not necessarily run out of theme, themed spells, I guess. I mean, obviously, you have the powerful options like Counterspell and whatever. But I'm going to say take Banishment. Because if we're playing a Pyromancer who gets their power from the Hells, what a cool thing to do to be able to send someone to the Hells. Just say, fuck you go to hell literally and it happens so banishment is just a fun option here probably never going to cast in a set in the most niche situations uh but i think just having it thematically is quite nice if you want something else take something else but i just kind of like grabbing this here now lastly we are at warlock level 11 and this this is a big level because it's the main reason we went this far in warlock was for this you gain a warlock spell slot normally warlocks only have two but if you go to level 11 you get three which instantly in my mind made the warlock way more viable for this type of build because in addition to all the non-spell slot spells we get the three max level basically fifth level spell slots that we get to cast our main spells plus our ability to do other things which i'll get to later you're not really limited by the warlock's limited spell slots anymore your cantrips are strong your your options outside of spell slots are strong and you are just going to be doing nuclear damage when you actually use those spell slots so having three of them is awesome we're also going to be getting mystic arcanum here now this is going to let us get a free level six spell slot that we get to cast and it does not cost um, any spell slot, but we only get to use it once per long rest. Unfortunately, and it is a great shame, 
none of these are on theme at all so to pick your favorite situation you want create undead to raise a badass deadly undead monster to your side maybe pulled out of the hells itself uh you can i'm not sure if summoning this will replace a conjured elemental or not if you can have both up at the same time play around with this and mix it up i didn't really have a chance to use this in testing uh but i think i will go with create undead to kind of go with like the hellraiser theme i think it's pretty cool uh we also get to take another spell of up to fifth level here there's nothing here that really speaks out to me as far as being a pyromancer so take so just pick your favorite here if you can think of something that you feel is on theme go for it uh, I am personally going to take here counter spell just because it is that really powerful option that's just sitting there that hasn't been taken. Yes, the limited uses of it that we want to be spending on pyro spells does suck, but you never know when that one counter spell is going to come in really, really clutch. And with that, we are done leveling. Um, I see. So as you can see here, we've got our five Warlock spell slots. We have two level one spell slots. So we do get a little bit more uses out of it, out of our spells here. But um, overall, you've got a lot of powerful kit here to work with. Play around with it. See what combos work for you and have fun. But here's where we get into the fun stuff yet again. The equipment in Baldur's Gate is what really does make this build stand out. So here we go. Uh, this is the the kind of equipment we're going with here. Uh, there is a unique status condition in this game. It is called Heat. Now, what Heat does is it, um, you basically kind of ignite yourself on fire, taking 1d4 of fire damage every turn, which we resist, by the way, so it's basically going to be about 1 to 2 damage, probably at most. Um, and for each, you can kind of build up how long this heat will last how many turns it will last for each turn of heat you get a point towards something called heat convergence which when selected it's a toggleable passive when selected your next fire damage attack will expend all of your turns of heat to add that much fire damage to that attack uh, so say you have for example eight turns of heat you will and then you use your heat conversion to cast fireball you'll do damage uh to any enemies in the fireball's radius through normal fireball damage plus an additional eight damage to each of them which is really really powerful so i've gone with a list of equipment here that build up or use heat in some way uh to kind of go with the idea of that really really hard to control flames within so i think it's really really cool so let's go over the equipment now Starting from the top, we've got the Circuit of Blasting. Now, there is a, um, a piece that does interact with heat, but it's really bad. So I just went with something that um, just gives us another use of a Scorching Ray as a level 2 spell. Pretty damn good. It's just another spell we can cast. Uh, the Cinder Moth Cloak, a creature that damages the wearer within 2 meters, receives the Burning Status Condition. It's just more fire damage to add to the Inferno. Uh, the Obsidian Laced Robe, it grants resistance to fire damage, which we already have as a Tiefling, so it's a bit useless, but I wanted it mainly for this. Flaming Revenge, on a successful saving throw against a foe's spell, deal 5 to 8 fire damage to them. Pretty nice, basically a free Hellish Rebuke for, on a saving throw. It's pretty nice. Uh, the Fermo Arcanic... Arcanic... Oh, Fermo Arcanic Gloves. Goodness me, that's a name. Um, whenever you deal fire damage, you gain two turns of heat. You're going to be using, um, a lot of fire spells, so... And it's just whenever you deal fire damage, so it can be, like, things from, like, fire shield, or the cloak that we just had, or anything, really. You get two turns of heat. And remember, for every turn of heat, that's another point of damage on a Nova spell. So, definitely, definitely want to have this on. Uh, the Cinder Shoes. When you burn an enemy, you gain two turns of heat. So, if you inflict the burning status condition, for example, through the Nymph Cloak, or I believe most fire spells in the game, uh, or things that create fire surfaces, uh, you will get heat. So, basically, if you launch a fire spell and you burn an enemy, you're getting four turns of heat right there in one attack. That is uh, for extra damage on another attack later. 
Let's move on to the necklace here. We have got the uh, necklace of elemental augmentation. When one of your cantrips deals ice, cold, fire, lightning or thunder damage, you add your spell casting modifier to the damage result. This is agonizing blast, but for all elemental cantrips, excluding poison. A uh, very, very, very cool option to have here, especially with our high charisma, basically giving us agonizing blast levels of power on our firebolt. A nice welcome addition. Uh, the Ring of Generation. As I said before, Heat deals 1d4 damage per turn, which we resist. So by having the Ring of Regeneration on, you basically counteract that entirely. So that takes away the negative side effect of Heat. Uh, the Ring of Self-Immolation. This is a unique ability which allows you to set yourself on fire to gain two turns of Heat immediately. Basically, once per short rest, as a bonus action, immediately gives yourself two turns of Heat. Pretty dang cool. A nice little utility thing to have. But the final thing here is the weapon, and this is the kicker. This is the Mark Oheshkir. I'm just going to call it the Markiplier Staff. So with the Markiplier Staff, right, you get... Uh, it's it's decent in hand. I mean, you get 2 to 9 damage. It's standard quarter staff damage. But it gets a ton of useful abilities. The first thing, Arcane Enchantment. You get a plus 1 bonus to spell, spell safe DC and spell attack rolls. Neat. Arcane Battery. Alleviate the arcane burden of the spell casting within the power of this staff. The next spell you cast doesn't cast a spell slot. Once per long rest. That is a once per long rest extra warlock spell slot for us. Huge for this build. But this is the best part. Yeah, this isn't the best part. This is the best part. Kareska's Favor. Imbue yourself with elemental energy sourced from the draconic goddess Kareska. Now, I already have this supplied, but basically what Kareska's favor does is it lets you choose until long rest and castable once per short rest an element to, to imbue yourself with. You've got thunder, arsenic, which I believe is poison, uh, lightning, uh, ice, uh, acid, and fire. What this does for us is, when you cast this, it causes every single one of your attacks to deal heat. I believe it's every one of our attacks. Let me just see. Uh, it should be here. I mean, I could probably just cast it and show you. So we get the Kreska's Flame. So every, every attack we do now is going to generate one extra point of heat, which is huge so that adds to our like heat build up which means even more damage on those nova attacks uh i believe yeah the standard condition is here yeah when the affected entity deals damage of a spell it gains one turn of heat uh while attuned to kareska's flame it can cast fireball and wall of fire so we get an extra use of fireball and wall of fire once per short rest again somewhat alleviating that limited spell slot problem so overall with our Warlock spell slots, we're getting up to four casts per long rests. With we get two extra casts with our level one spell slots, two extra casts with our um, weapon buff. I believe, th yeah, we got two extra casts with our racial abilities. As many casts of fireball as a uh, firebolt. My apologies, as we want. Uh, a, a once per long rest, fire chromatic orb, and anything our Condra elemental can do. I think I've solved the limited spell slot problem to the best of my ability. Now, obviously, even with all this combined, you're still not going to be casting as many spells a day as a sorcerer, but even sorcerers still need to recover their spell slots on a long rest unless they use their sorcery points to do it. And while I don't know many sorcerers that would actually do that because sorcery points are really strong as sorcery points. So I think I've done a pretty good job here of basically turning the warlock into a proper full caster. Um, I mean, obviously this isn't going to be everyone's preferred flavor of Pyromancer, but I really, really wanted to do something different here. But there is one slight thing I want to go over. So, while Heat as a mechanic is well and good, I think by the time you reach the very, very late game when you're going to be around sort of getting close to the end, I don't think it's really going to be um, that satisfying to use anymore. I mean, unless you're basically constantly building up heat, like at least like five or six heat per turn, which is really tricky to do in the later game. 
uh, it's not really going to be worth it. So here's what I would suggest. Once you get into Act 3, uh, you replace your headpiece with the Hell Dusk Helmet. This is going to allow you to see a magical or ordinary darkness, and you cannot be blinded. Uh, plus two to saving throws against spells. And you also get the Immolating Gaze, which is another decently strong fire attack that frightens your opponent. It can be used once per short rest. It's an intelligence save, so it might not always um, work out on the frightened bit, but definitely the extra damage is quite nice because it's fire damage. It counts towards our racial stuff. We're also going to look at the Hell Dust Gloves. I've used these before in a couple of my builds, and they still apply here. Basically, you're going to be getting uh, an extra 1d6 fire damage on um, your melee attacks, and also a plus one bonus to spell rolls and DCs. Uh, but, I mean, obviously, that's not really what we're using it for here. We're going to be using it re. Where's my inventory? Because that's the wrong button. And I've pressed the wrong button again. <laughs> Uh, you get Rays of Fire, which is a really, really powerful version of um, Scorching Ray, which is going to do a ton of damage once per short rest. Uh, hurl three Rays of Fire, and each Ray of Fire deals 3 to 18 fire damage. Huge, huge spell. Another big attack for us to use. And it's fire damage, so it counts to all our bonuses. Then you have to Hell Dust Boots, which means you can't be um, forcibly moved by foes, spells, or actions, and you ignore the effects of difficult terrain. While you fail, when you fail off the saving throw, you can use a reaction to succeed it instead, and then you also get the Hellcrawler feature, which allows you to basically use a Misty Step that does fire damage on impact. This is really cool. But here's the main kicker. This is the Hell Dusk armor. When you put them all on, they look awesome together, but... This is the most powerful single piece of armor in the game, in my opinion. You get a 21 armor class, uh, you don't have to have proficiency with the armor to use it. It's heavy armor, but you are considered proficient while wearing it. Uh, when you succeed a saving throw, the caster receives burning for three turns. You have resistance to fire damage and cannot be burned. I mean, a little bit more pointless for us, but whatever. You also take three less damage from all sources. Damn. You also get to cast Fly, I believe, once per long rest for free. As a bonus action. Nice. Uh... This is a really, really good thematic piece of armor for us. I mean, you get all the pieces of the Helldusk armor, and it's like because your patron is so impressed uh, with your ability to use fire that they've granted you the armor of the Hells itself. Pretty neat. Uh, the reason I don't use this armor piece in my builds, and this is going to be probably something that's going to be true across my builds, I really will avoid using this armor where possible, but I'm talking about it here, um, is because... A mild spoiler here, but this is the armor you get for defeating what is essentially the game's super boss. So by the time you would get this armor in a build, the game's pretty much over. So I don't like recommending it because um, it's not really feasible. The other Helldusk armor pieces you can get the very second you enter Act 3 if you know what you're doing. But this actually requires defeating the game's hardest boss. Well, maybe not the hardest, but definitely a very very difficult boss um so i can't really recommend it in 90 percent of my builds but i'm just leaving it as an option here because it is really really on theme with this build and i wanted to include it but it's definitely not necessary which is why i've included this other set of skills oh goodness me be decent um so and i think the obsidian laced robe if you take mage armor which i forgot to do Oh no, you don't need to because we have Draconic Resilience. Uh, this will carry you like pretty much through the game and you can get another piece of like clothing or something that you think is better because unfortunately we don't have proficiencies in armor. So this is the only big bulky piece of armor we can really wear, but it's not a bad option. I mean, look at it. It looks badass. Uh, but yeah, that is the build. This is my take on a Pyromancer. I mean, obviously, as I have said, this is not going to be everyone's uh, cup of tea, everyone's favorite flavoring of this. Um, but I think it definitely um, it definitely works. I think it's a really, really interesting thing. You get th the most diverse set of fire spells ever. Uh, I believe the only two fire spells we missed was Heat Metal which requires a concentration, so if you're concentrating on anything else, it might not really work. Uh, and I can't see it being that useful in the late game either, even though it is a powerful spell, most of the late game bosses aren't really going to be affected by it. 
Uh, there's also, um, oh god, what is it? Uh, Searing Smite. And I did consider taking a couple of levels of Paladin with maybe like the Sorcerer and do like a Fire Sorcerer build. But I didn't really like that in the end because I just, because at that point, if you're using Searing Smite, you're losing out on power by just using the Divine Smite that's already there. So I didn't really like it thematically. But with this build, you are getting spells that are normally exclusive to other real high level classes, multiple different options and thematic theming and thematic options for fire damage, such as being able to make an elemental. Uh, which one's the fire one? This one. And in fact, I will go over the fire elemental quick because it's got a nice little kit. Uh, you get a regular smoldering touch attack. It does 2d6 fire and it can inflict burning. Uh, Erupting Cinder, which is basically like it's a slightly weaker version of Fireball. Uh, it gains the ability to warp, and it also has a multi-attack, which is probably what you're mostly going to be using. Uh, but it is a nice extra option to have. It has a lot of health, more than we do, so it's quite tanky. Definitely a very, very nice option to have. Uh, so yeah, that is the build. Uh, this kind of Nine Hells Pyromancer Warlock. Uh, you'll see um, the combat footage now where uh, I took on uh, the tutorial boss, as I always do. Um, and it was actually quite an interesting fight. You're going to see the numbers are quite low, uh, unfortunately. I think I was just rolling really low, but also, obviously, these uh, demons are going to be good against fire. Um, and I was also using in that footage a piece of armor which I don't use in the final build, which was the Pyro Quickness hat. Now, the Pyro Quickness hat, you see it, and you just think, oh my god, this is amazing. Uh, basically, what it does is, if you cast a fire spell, you um, you get a second bonus action. Which, on paper, sounds insane. But let me stop you there, because what is a... What is basically a pure caster doing with a second bonus action? I'll tell you what, jack shit. So it wasn't very useful, especially when it basically made us take 2d4 fire damage per turn, which actually, in this combat footage, got me killed. So, because this build is quite squishy, if you're not using the Helldusk set. So you do need to be a bit careful. You are definitely a ranged character, and this is the first kind of what I would call pure ranged character that I've ever built. So be careful with this build. You're not going to be as strong in the late game. Uh, at least tanky, so you're definitely going to be want to definitely going to want to be hanging back while the rest of your party goes in. Uh, I also completely forgot to mention, but we do get Flame Blade by the time we're total level five. Uh, it can't be outcast, unfortunately, but it is a unique version of Flame Blade, which um, is cast with Charisma instead of Wisdom. So it uses your Charisma modifier for the attack roll, not the damage. Uh, it does do 3d6 fire damage, so it is a useful option, I think, as a weapon until you get to our staff of choice, the Markiplier staff. So, um, yeah. Overall, I think this build is pretty dang cool. I think it's nice to have my own personal take on a Pyromancer. Again, it didn't end up being, I guess, the most creative build. I mean, it was creative thematically, but... Um, Obviously, we did stick with one class for the majority of its lifespan. And while I do think the unique choice of um, our, you know, our choice of the Pact Boon and the um, and the Eldritch Invocations give, did give us a pretty unique take on a Warlock, especially a Pyromancer. Uh, I, if I was to give this build a power rating... I do think it has a really high potential for single round damage, basically just opening combat, going nuclear for a couple of turns, and then needing a short rest. But as for sustained power and overall combat versatility, I would definitely rate my Psionic Warrior or Dante builds way higher. Uh, I do, as much as like, I like this build, I think you're going to get more versatility and more overall usefulness out of just doing the typical Draconic Sorcerer build, but or maybe a wizard build, like an evocation wizard for a pyromancer. But I just, I really wanted flame strike. I really wanted contra elemental. I really wanted, um, you know, fire shield. But I, I don't think I. This isn't the strongest pyromancer build you can make, but I definitely think it is one of the most fun pyromancer builds you can make, thematically and otherwise. 
I would also kind of maybe play this as an evil character. I feel like that might be cool, but uh, that's just me. Anyways, I'm going to stop rambling now. This was a fun build to make overall. Uh, my next video is probably going to be another character build. I think I've got an idea for a character in mind that I would like to do. Otherwise, I'm going to go with another request or perhaps another theme. So I'll be taking requests uh, probably if this video goes up on Friday. And you can most likely expect a new video on Saturday and maybe Sunday as well, but that's not guaranteed. Uh, so I would say, yeah, so I would probably say video on Saturday, maybe Sunday. We'll see. But yep, that's me done. And I'll see you all next time.